We consistently demand um, that our city's resources go towards programs and services most needed in the communities in which we work. And um, these are kind of the areas that we focus on. So one is housing and tenants rights. We really believe that we want to eliminate housing insecurity in the city. Two, environmental justice to mitigate climate change impacts and stop environmental racism. Three, uh, redefining public safety to shift away from policing to community-based services. Four, democratizing power to create an environment where all San Diego residents can thrive. And worker justice to stop wage theft and help families make ends meet. And we really focus our work at the city level uh, because the city is responsible for essential services that are kind of of most concern to uh, residents. And these are things like parks, street lights, trees, stormwater infrastructure, um, trash collection, police, fire rescue, and other like neighborhood specific programs that um, are really just like other immediate concern. When you walk at your door, that's what you see the city is responsible for it. And we specifically focus our work on the city budget because to get the things that we want to see in our communities, they have to be budgeted for. And just to give a taste, like just in the past four years, our coalition has advocated for and won um, the creation of a housing and stability prevention program that provides subsidies to families on the brink of homelessness, uh, funding to support the Climate Action Plan, which helps combat climate change, uh, the creation of the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement, which helps make sure the city enforces worker rights, tree planting, increased language access, an Office of Child and Youth Success, and so much more. Yeah. And so we do all of this work at the city budget, but we're of course here tonight to hear from our uh, future mayoral candidates. And so I want to just cover real quickly why the mayor's position is so important, especially when we talk about the budget. Um, the mayor's role is critical in the budget process, and they have the power to oversee all city uh, departments and operations, hire and fire top city officials, appoint or approve um, residents to city boards and commissions, veto any policies or budget decisions made by the city council, represent the city and regional bodies such as the San Diego Association of Government or SANDAG, which plans and builds major transportation and freeway projects and public transit, and then, of course, they create the annual budget. Um, so with that said, we're super excited to hear from the candidates tonight that are running for this critical position, and um, learn about their stances and the issues that we most care about. And so I'll now introduce our moderator for the evening to explain the format of the forum and guide us through learning about the candidates' positions. So Andrea Lopez Giafania is the managing editor of Voice of San Diego. She oversees the newsroom and all content. She writes a weekly newsletter called Cup of Chisme and is one of the hosts of the VOSD podcast. She graduated from the San Diego State University and worked as a community reporter at the San Diego Union Christian. So please help me welcome Andrea. I just want to 
want to thank you all for joining us today. And as a reminder and note to our audience, the candidates have agreed to set a forum guidelines. And I just want to highlight a couple things before we begin. Um, one of those is that the preset questions were submitted by coalition organizations and attendees through the event registration form. Uh, the Community Budget Alliance 2024 Mailer Forum Program Committee reviewed and selected questions for appropriateness and to avoid duplicate questions. Um, but if you submitted a question and we do not get to it, um, our program organizers will make sure to send those to the candidates so they know what questions are important to the community. Each candidate, um, candidates' names have been chosen at random to determine the order in which they will give opening statements. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. Opening statements will be followed by a series of open-ended and yes or no questions. Uh, Kelly over here, volunteer. Uh, she will hold little signs to let you know um, how much time you have left and maybe we can wrap it up as soon as she holds that sign. Um, <clears throat> candidates will be given one minute to respond to each open-ended question. I may ask follow-up questions because that's in my nature, um, but you will have 30 seconds to respond. <laughs> and then for the yes or no questions, we ask that you stick to yes and no. At the conclusion of the forum, each of you will get one minute for a closing statement. Each question will be addressed to all the candidates and I will vary in the order in which the candidates answer. I did these by random. I used a handy little app that let me select you guys by random. Um, let's see. All right, let's get started over here. Candidates are expected to strictly adhere to time limits. A CBA coalition member will just lay a countdown timer. As I said, Kelly over here, a volunteer. So make sure you keep an eye on her. We will get started on opening statements, and we'll start with Larry Turner. <laughs> test, test. All right. Thank you all very much for being here. It's awesome whenever we get an opportunity to talk to the public and uh, hear from you your concerns and let you learn a little bit about us. Uh, just get it, I only have two minutes, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. I am not a politician and uh, never wanted to be and still sometimes question why I'm doing this because uh, the political world is not, uh, it's dirtier than you think. So uh, I'm sure all of us up here can tell you about that. But uh, what I've seen there are some things in this city that need change. Uh, we do not have a mayor right now who's doing a very good job. Uh, he's doing a terrible job. So uh, I want to tell you all that there's hope, though. We've got uh, so much potential in this city that we can unleash and we can turn it around. Uh, there's so many great people out here in this audience and in all the other communities I go to that uh, you have the answer. You know your community better than anybody. And uh, to have a uh, mayor's office at City Hall that pushes down their ideas on you without your input, that uh, doesn't treat the neighborhoods fairly, um, which is evidenced by the way the budget is spent, uh, especially when it comes to infrastructure in certain neighborhoods. Um, you know, even uh, whenever I go around to uh, some of the neighborhoods that are a little more wealthy uh, and they tell me about the amount of money they spent uh, on their roads, for example, and how often the roads are fixed. And then I go through some of the other neighborhoods and I see that the roads haven't been fixed for 20 or 30 years. I mean, this is just obvious, and you all know that. I mean, we all, we all know, we can sense that something's wrong here, and, and you're ready for some change. So, uh, you know, whichever one of us you pick, uh, I, I know that we're going to bring the change. It's going to be great to see somebody besides uh, Mayor Gloria. Uh, up in, uh, in City Hall. Uh, I'm looking forward to November. I think you all should be really happy about the future, uh, whoever's up there, as long as it's uh, not the incumbents. And I would also tell you, um, you know, March 5th is really important. Some of you don't understand, it's the top two vote getters. So whoever you want to be up there at the top two, you've got to do it on March 5th, or else you just get what you get when it comes to uh, November. Uh, so I don't want you to be surprised by who's on those, those top two. And please, not just mayor, I know tonight's a mayor uh, forum, but think about those city council reps too. They need to be replaced. Uh, we we, would all, we want to see new faces in all those positions. Thanks. Thank you. Very much. Next, we'll go to Jane. Hello, my name is Jane Louise Glasson. I have worked for a school district for about two decades, San Diego Unified School District. Um, I like to be my best. 
when I'm at school, so I'll be as positive as I can be, um, and professional. Uh, I'm a graduate of San Diego State University, San Diego State University, Maricosta College, and Palomar College. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Child Development, an Associate degree in General Studies, and an Associate degree in Foreign Languages. I studied Spanish, French, and German at Maricosta College, and I took one semester of Amer American Sign Language at Palomar College. I took one semester of German because I didn't have enough time. I have been a homeowner and resident in the city of San Diego since 1998. I have lived in San Diego County all my life. At a, boy, at a Boys and Girls Club, I was Young Lady of the Year twice. At Palomar College, I volunteered as a chapter officer for both honor societies, membership secretary and point secretary. For my HOA, I volunteered as treasurer and secretary. In athletics, I was in second place in the girls 16 to 18 division in the area finals in both seasons. I competed in the Pepsi Cola NBA Hot Shot competition and represented the NBA Clippers. I played college I played college volleyball and college tennis for Maricosta College. I coached the girls JV tennis team at La Jolla High School and uh, that's a bit about me. Our campaign will tell you the truth. You must accept the truth. I am an independent candidate. The two major political parties are corrupt. And a special interests that get these people elected are corrupt. And you must accept the truth. You must. I was the first candidate to go on city television and speak for ceasefire yes. in the Middle East. The first one. Despite the fact that Iman Taha of the mosque in Claremont and Dr. Mohammed have endorsed my campaign Despite the fact that the Jewish community of which I am a member, a lifetime member, has, been, has helped our campaign, and my neighbor, Cardinal McElroy, and the Catholic Diocese behind our back, despite all of this, and my website, dannytrywithanI.com, go on there, take a look at it. Take a look at all the people backing our campaign. We're not corrupted. We're not corrupted by the Democratic Party. And we never will be. And I am a friend of Reverend George Stevens. Despite all of that, the voice of San Diego has ignored our campaign for one year while we were on our knees. And now we have 50 people working day and night and they have ignored us. They have not mentioned our name one time, not once. That is unconscionable. And I will never lie to any of you. Thank you, Dan. Now we're going to do it. Genevieve. Good evening, everyone. My name is Genevieve Jones Wright, and I am a very proud resident of Southeast San Diego. And if you've heard anything about my story, you will know that I grew up in low-income housing where I was raised by my single mother. Well, we are directly across the street from where I was raised. And my mother just happens to be here in the audience. And I won't ask her to stand because she is very shy. I don't know where I get all this from. But I really want you all to understand where I come from. When I was in the fourth grade, I learned about Justice Thurgood Marshall, and I decided that like him, I was going to use the law to make our world better, to make our world more fair. And not only was I going to be like Justice Thurgood Marshall and be a lawyer who changed the world, I was gonna go and train where he trained. And that meant that I had to go to Howard University School of Law. 
And so that is where I went. I came home, I passed the bar, and to my mother's dismay, I went back to school. <laughs> I went to California Western School of Law right here downtown San Diego, and I got a Master of Laws. I served the entire county of San Diego as a public defender for 13 years. I then left and started my own nonprofit, of which I am the executive director of. My nonprofit is Community Advocates for Just and Moral Governance. That's a mouthful, so we go by MOBO. But what we do is very important. Every single day, I work to hold the government accountable. We work for a just and a moral government. So while we're here tonight talking about the budget, I understand that budgets are value statements and they have to reflect the needs and the priorities and the concerns of the people. I look forward to talking with you all more tonight. I am, of course, from an underserved community where people told me I wasn't going to amount to anything. Well, now I'm running for mayor and we can have a mayor that comes from South of VA and do right by every single community. We're going to start with an open-ended question on flooding, and this question will be read by a community member representative with the pillars of the community. With no planning, they don't plan. They have no planning. 
Thank you, Dan. I'm going to follow up really quickly, and I'll give you 30 seconds to respond. How would you determine for you, Dan? A follow-up question. How would you determine which departments you should cut from, keeping equity in mind? Very good question. Our campaign, we have the greatest minds, the brightest of the bright in this city, mid-George Law School graduates, top engineers, medical doctors, PhDs, economic economists. In fact, a former Asian uh, Mr. Gwynn, Dr. Gwynn, who didn't make it to the ballot and is an Asian, he is on our campaign steering committee and he will be in my administration. Thank and you. We... Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Genevieve. Thank you. We are talking about equity. And when we talk about equity, we have to be precise. The eight freeway divide is a very real divide. We are talking about systemic neglect. We're not talking about just past practices, but we are talking about current practices that have perpetuated the, the very thing that resulted in the flooding. The flooding was avoidable, it was preventable, and when I hear about the thousands of people who were displaced, the only answer that anyone should give that wants to be your mayor is that we have to fund the communities who have been left behind. We have not been maintained. We have continued to be underserved and under resources. This is an equity issue. Until we get the communities up to standard so they can catch up, then we can continue to do non-critical projects, but that is how I would prioritize. Thank you. A follow-up question to you, though, Jenny. Um, you speak of uh, funding communities that have been left behind. Um, are you supporting any of the, um, you know, tax increase initiatives going forward that you know seek to fund some of those infrastructure and stormwater needs? Absolutely not, and I'll tell you why. Our city government has mismanaged and wasted our taxpayer funds for way too long. I do not believe in asking any of us to go into our pockets and give our government any more money when they cannot show us they can do what is right with the money. There are other ways to get money, i.e. not diverting funds from our infrastructure as we did to overpay by $19 million for 101 Ash Street, which really happened. We need to get state and federal funds for the things we need to do, but I am not asking San Diego to pay more in sales tax. Thank you. We'll go to Larry. As was already said, this is so avoidable, and it's been going on for far too long. And uh, I, I had the honor of driving through the neighborhoods that were affected just 10 days before the floods came. And uh, some of the community leaders were showing me, you know, the decades of decay to your infrastructure. And uh, I've seen this in other neighborhoods as well. And, and just as Genevieve said, the ones that need to get the, the improvements first are the ones that are so far behind. And that's gonna be the, the, the primary focus that we have is to get everybody back up to speed. And I know that doesn't sound you know, real popular to some of the folks. They think that they're not gonna get uh, uh, you know, their areas improved upon, but we gotta get everybody up to speed, especially when it's a life and death situation. You know, this is something uh, that they, they tried to move money uh, into other in other pockets um, at the risk of lives. And at the end of the day, they're going to spend billions of dollars settling these lawsuits. It's going to put the city even more in debt. They could have just fixed this stuff from the beginning. Sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Who is taking money where? You said Why well, I said I get another 30 second follow? Oh, sorry. Um, I'll go with Jane. Thanks. Um, flooding was pretty bad. I had to take off my shoes and socks to walk across the crosswalk to get to Mary Mesa High School because I had to walk through about six inches of water. Um, I feel bad for the students who need to walk to school with, and have soaked 
the shoes. Um, Sandy needs to do better. Some money should not be wasted on things like 101 Ash Street. That was a terrible shame. Um, I have worked with budgets before. I worked as, I volunteered as a treasurer and secretary and also a member at large for my HOA. And we looked carefully at the budget and we talked with the company that helped us to manage Mirabella, where I live. And um, it's just so important to listen to all the experts and talk to us for the city. The mayor needs to listen to the city council members. Thank you, Jane. We'll go on to our second open-ended question. This one has to do with environmental justice, and it will be read by a Mid-City Camp representative. Um, Mayor Mason was supposed to get money to um, make a skate park in 
Um, but the money was not given to them. I think I think it's going to be fixed soon, though. Um, we've got to take care of our youth. Their youth center was taken over. The squatters live there now, and we've got to give give something back to the youth because they need to be happier. They need to know that we care. Thank you, Jane. My campaign is all about creating opportunities for every single San Diego to thrive. And I talk about creating these opportunities through three pathways. The second pathway that I talk about is the pathway to whole and vibrant neighborhoods. This question connects with that pathway. When we talk about our parks, when we talk about our green spaces, when we talk about places for our children to run around, this is how we begin to build whole communities and neighborhoods. So I would prioritize equitably the parks all around San Diego, but that means, going back to the equity issue, that community members in City Heights, for example, would be heard. There's an initiative right now to make some renovations to Henwood Park. Why has that not been done yet? We need to hear from community members about how they would like to see their neighborhoods look, how to make their parks safe spaces for children, and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. This is not my campaign. It is your campaign, and our campaign, and we. Darian Tolliver, a professional African-American basketball player, professional, at Lincoln High, right here. He came out of Lincoln High, he played here. He's on my campaign staff, he's helping us. We are a colorblind campaign. Coretta Scott King wrote my father and offered to meet with him. We are a colorblind campaign. But you, all of you need to wake up to the corruption of the two major political parties and why I quit. Maybe you don't like to hear the truth, but you need to hear it. You need to hear how the special interests fund these Democratic candidates year after year, and I'm an independent. And what I tell you, I give you my word, we will find the funds in the budget. Thank you, Dan. We'll move on to our next open-ended question. This is on democratizing power. Wow, that why is that a hard word to pronounce? <laughs> democratizing power. Um, this will be read by an Alliance San Diego representative. My name is Isabel Barada Chavez with the Lions San Diego. And the question I have is, since September of 2023, tens of thousands of people seeking asylum have been dropped at transit stations to appear in immigration court at their final destinations in the U.S. Asylum seekers come to the U.S. for protection or safety reasons to people who have been forced to leave their own countries for their safety or because of war. Although some of these individuals and families are moving through the region to other destinations, thousands will stay in San Diego permanently. What should the city's role be in assisting the people who are arriving in our region to seek asylum, and how will you uplift and protect the rights of immigrants and refugees in our city? Um, what should the city's role be in assisting people who are arriving in our region to seek asylum? How will you uplift and protect the rights of immigrants and refugees in our city? And I'll start with Jen Diaz. San Diego is a border city. So we must understand that migrants and people who are seeking asylum are going to come to San Diego, whether it is a pass-through point or whether it is their final destination. But we have a responsibility to assist people who are fleeing other countries based on persecution or war, and we have a responsibility to help out every single human. I do not have a scarcity mindset. 
We know that we have money to take care of other human beings. We have to do a better job as the city, collaborating with the county, and also with federal agencies. It is time for our federal counterparts to also help and assist. And as mayor, I would leverage my relationships with people who are in these other agencies and positions to make sure that we do right by the people who are here in San Diego so we can continue to be a welcoming city. Here's more truth that you probably do not want to hear. I train for Ironman in Hakamba. I go there every week, and I see people going through the border fence like a sieve, like water coming through a sieve. Well, let me ask you a question. Why do we have the Department of State? What do they do? Okay, they have a process for these people that come in, and they need to come through in a legal process not just coming in willy-nilly and running through the border like it's an open border, like there's a leak in your plumbing. It, it, it's ridiculous. Now, I believe in humanity. My father attended a seminary, and I want to help these people. But we can only help so many people, ladies and gentlemen. We have America, we have all of you to help. Now, my primary mission is to help all of you, and then if we have anything remaining, our administration at 202 C Street will help those that need help, but my primary obligation is to all of you. Thank you, Dan. James? I like the idea of student, student breakfasts and student lunches that are offered to the students for free in the San Diego Unified, San Diego Unified School District. I'd love to see um, food like that, the portions, given to people who have not had breakfast, have not had lunch, and would like to have something to eat. It's important that we meet that basic need of feeding people properly so that they don't have to search through a trash can. We need to um, protect their health, when they come here to the United States, whether they come here um, with permission or not. We don't want anyone searching in a trash can for food. And we also, the clothing drives are important too. I'm sure a lot of people would like to donate clothing that no longer need to those who are in need. Thank you, Jane. I just went down to uh, the end of the border wall, just south of uh, the uh, Golden Acor. I went out there yesterday morning and checked it out. And uh, you know, it's there is no federal agencies out there at all. And and I say that not because you know they need to be out there and, and, and round them up and arrest them or anything. Not, not at all. But we got to offer these people some humanitarian assistance. We can't just have them coming into this into our area, uh, not speaking the language. Uh, you know, many of them. Uh, don't speak the language, don't know the area, don't have people here that, that are uh, going to be caring for them. They have no water. We are so much better than that. And when our city, and I know that our city is told whenever some of these busloads are being dropped off, yet no city resources are being offered to them. And, and uh, this is something that we're obviously going to have to take care of. You know, these people need a, a shelter bed, they need food, they need opportunity, and we're going to do that. Uh, but the federal government needs to pay for some of this. And if we can't get them to pay, we're going to sue for that money. But at the end of the day, they're humans. We're going to help them. We're going to give them every chance here in America uh, that, that we can. But uh, you know, it, it's a humanitarian crisis that we need to tackle. Thank you, Larry. And a couple of rapid fire questions for you all. Uh, just a reminder: these are yes or no responses, please. Um, if you'd like, I allow a short sentence explanation. Goes longer, I will cut you off. <laughs> no nonsense here. Um, okay, first question. Youth Opportunity Passes provides free access to transit for all youth 18 and under across San Diego County. The recent program impact study results show clear success in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and fostering the next generation of transit riders. Preliminary survey results from young riders showed 
that 79% of youth plan to keep using public transit as adults. And 77 said riding public transit feels safer than their previous travel methods. Clearly, they drive the same way I do. <laughs> Currently, the program is set to end in June 2026. If elected, would you support making youth opportunity passes a permanent program for all of you? I'll start with Jane. Yes. Um, Thank you. Um, I think it's very important that students get one of these. I, I use mine each month now because I needed to get a car to come here this evening. I got a rented car, but I think it's very important that students see the value of these. Um, Thank you. Don't forget to tap your Pronto card. Larry. Yes, and I would make our transit system safer and cleaner to where you feel comfortable sending your children on it. Absolutely. I propose this very idea 20 years ago. Because I take public transportation. And I'm from Missouri. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Another one, yes or no, for a short sentence. According to the U.S. Immigration Policy Center at UCSD, the foreign-born population in this city speaks at least 70 different languages and dialects, and approximately half 50.9% of the foreign-born population in the city are limited English proficient. Despite this, the city of San Diego currently has limited interpretation at most meetings and events and does not translate most material for non-English speakers to participate in city matters. Will you commit to funding a comprehensive citywide language access program that provides written materials in languages other than English and allows residents to easily engage in city council meetings, citywide programs, and community meetings, opportunities in their native language. Dan. Yes, and I'll do more than that, much more. My graduate degree is in linguistics and foreign language. I will go out there and work personally to help them as mayor. I have no problem with that. My mother and father came from Europe. English was their second language. Thank I grew you, up in language. Thank you. Jane. Yes, it's very important. We have students who are still English language learners, uh, many students, and it's important that their, their families be able to read the border information and Thank other information. Thank you, Jim. Genevieve? Yes, every single communication that comes from the city, all of our public hearings should be available and accessible to people who speak the languages of the residents in San Diego, Farsi, Arabic, Somali, Spanish, Vietnamese, whatever the language is, that's the job of the city to communicate with its residents. And also, sorry, the last question that was about migrants, I failed to say, as mayor, I would invest in our Office of Immigrant Affairs because that is important. If there are um, any other comments that you guys um, you know, wanted to add, you will have a couple minutes once we finish the questions. Larry. Yes, my wife's family is all first generation Mexican, so I got to see this uh, personally with their family, and it, it, it really uh, hits home with me, so I am very much in favor. Thank you. Uh, we will return to our open ended questions. This one is on housing and tenants' rights, and we have a representative with ACE.
Good evening. My name is Barbara Pinto. I'm a representative from ACE, which stands for the Alliance of California for Community Empowerment. San Diego's escalating homelessness crisis underscores the need for proactive measures, such as increased funding for prevention-focused programs to address the root causes of homelessness. According to the Regional Task Force on the Homeless, more people entered homelessness in 2022 than any year prior, with 13 San Diegans experiencing homelessness for the first time for every 10 San Diegans who are housed through a program. Millions of dollars are spent on providing outreach and assistance to the unhoused, but not enough is spent to prevent people from falling into homelessness in the first place. My question and your question is, what investments would you be willing to make to prevent people from falling into homelessness? That's a great question, and uh, it's something I talk about a lot when I go to meetings, and something that people just really don't address very often, is that having that intelligence network out there of social workers that are identifying these people beforehand, and that ounce of prevention is worth that pound, right? If we can identify these people beforehand, even if it, it does cost us a little bit of money, a little bit of job training, a little bit of extra, two extra hundred dollars a month, you know, these are things that even if you, you, you don't have the compassion where you see it on that side, even on the dollars and cents side, it saves us so much money. You know, so even if you're just looking at it as an accountant, that's the way to go. We got to we got to find these people ahead of time. How do we do that? We're gonna we're gonna redouble our efforts on this on the uh, social worker side that reaches out to all these people that are off the verge, all those people that are at the cusp of it. We identify them early on, and we can do that. And there's there's so much money available in this. I see so much wasteful spending with the nonprofits. There's so many good ones of nonprofits out there. There's many of them that are not using their money properly. And uh, you know, I can talk to you for hours about that. However, um, I'm just telling you, our city has enough money to be able to put out that effort and assist the people before they make homes at home. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a great one. Larry, uh, you mentioned um, prevention. Is there anything specific where you see you know, those additional funds going to? Um, you mentioned social workers, but I'm curious. Yeah, so it's uh, it, it's with all the members of the community, but I would just say that definitely with the social worker side um, and, and uh, identifying those life skills that we need to help these people with. Not everybody had the uh, you know the parents or the school teachers that help teach them those things that keep us you know in paying rent, paying our bills, balancing the checkbook, all that. So having those those life skills taught in schools at the community uh, centers is is key. You know that, that financial awareness training that we just don't have in schools anymore. Uh, teaching people about it. how to buy a home, <laughs> you know, and the opportunities there. Find people that are renting houses for 40 years. We could have bought a home so, so long ago. So just educating people is the key. Thank you. Uh, I'm endorsed by Ace Action, so I better get this answer right. <laughs> Um, we need to invest in 
our future made a mess and everybody of all ages. Uh, California had a very hard time being closed for so long. People could not go to work. People had to um, bear not getting any money from people who rented from them. Um, California was closed for way too long. It should not have been. Um, California could be doing much better if we had not been closed so long. Now, I know that there, there is a homeless population who um, have special needs, like there so I have seen at least one person um, with autism. I know he has autism because I know the, the signs, and he needs help. Many people need help. They, they need to be um, known better. They need to see what they really need, what the underlying things are that they really need for their special needs. Thank you. Is there any area specifically that you would want to invest in should you uh, be elected mayor? I want to want to focus on all areas of this, all areas of the city of San Diego. Um, everybody matters. I'm, I know I talk about Mayor Mesa a lot, but that's because I'm usually just in Mayor Mesa because I usually don't drive a car. Um, I care about all of city, all of the city of San Diego. I want to see why. Thank you, Dan. Despite the fact. That I'm Danny Try, D A N N Y T R I dot com. It's not hard, folks. You can go on it. We have two pages on the homeless solutions on that website. I'm a landlord. I've taken in the homeless, I've taken them in to my home without paying rent, without reservation. And as a landlord, I will go to other landlords and get them to take in the homeless. And this is why Voice of San Diego has ignored our campaign. This is why they have done it, because they know we're a threat. They know it. We have solutions, ladies and gentlemen. But you've got to go on dannytry.com. Thank you. Thank you. Our next open-ended question has to do with worker justice, and this will be read by a UDW representative. My name is David Hatch from UDW. Working families are having difficulty making ends meet in San Diego. To barely cover basic needs, an individual must make at least $66,000 annually. For a family of four, that figure skyrocketed to almost $140,000. Yet, one in four people are struggling to get by on less than $26,000 a year. Disparity is stark. Crushing families already are on the edge. Stagnant wages, a lack of good paying jobs, and high road employers, higher rates of wage theft, and difficulty assessing affordable child care and elder care all contribute to families struggling to make ends meet. My question is, how will you improve <coughs> wages and working conditions for families and defend workers' rights? You know what's going to happen on April 1st? Minimum wage is going to go up to, um, it's going to go up quite a bit at fast food restaurants. If you're a 60 or more in the United States, like Jack in the Box, um, Chipotle, you know, um, fast food restaurants, if there are at least 60 in the United States, the cost is going to go up really high in food. It's going to help families because um, those who are working at some restaurants are going to make much more, so that will be good for them. Uh, I will say, we are going to be priced out. Even the people that work at fast food restaurants, they're going to realize that they don't have as much money to spend after all because the cost of living is going to be much higher for them. I, 
care about everyone as we see inflation continue to skyrocket. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Dan. My Uber driver coming up here asked me the same question. City Heights. I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear, first of all. When I graduated from SDSU in 1982, there was a big recession. In my first job for one year, I cleaned toilets in, at the old home federal bank. Now, the cornerstone of my campaign, and again, you will not want to hear this, but, but the cornerstone of my campaign is predicated on American old-fashioned hard work and initiative. Now, there comes a point where we have to be held responsible for initiative. I broke down when I had to clean those toilets, but I didn't. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a double-edged sword. We, we cannot save the city's budget and, and, and completely fund people because they're not making ends meet. Now, I realize that. But as mayor, I will do everything possible, everything possible to enable all of you. Thank you, Dan. Genevieve? We have to take care of the people who take care of us. And workers make our city run. If we don't take care of our workers, then how can we say that government is doing their minimum? So as mayor, I would invest city funds into the county's worker justice program. There is a fund that the county has that the city does not need to duplicate, but should give money to. Because what we are not talking about is the fact that a lot of members of vulnerable communities are victims of wage theft. When I ran for DA in 2018, I was the only candidate to talk about how we can protect our workers from wage theft. The city needs to protect its workers from wage theft and give workers the information and resources against retaliation so they can file. We need to be able to compensate our workers while they're working to get the back payment. My time is up, but I have more to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I would definitely enact policies that are going to protect the workers. I, I'm, I'm a union worker right now, and uh, you know, I, I love the unions. But more importantly, uh, I think is is to really turn on the economic engines of the city. To really put a lot more green in everybody's pocket, and we can do that. Our city's been suffering financially for too long. Um, this is not just the you know we're the eighth largest city. We've got the 28th largest city in Las Vegas, just kicking our butt. You know, with, with proteins, with, uh, with the sphere, with the amount of people that are going there on vacation, we got to fill our, our uh, convention center. We need to be filling that all, all throughout the year. We need to be filling our hotels, filling our restaurants. And when that happens, that's going to be the mayor, the CEO, the managers, the, everybody is going to be doing better. And we got to do that. We, obviously, it's the most expensive city, the, our SDG and the, we got to tackle all of that. However, whenever we let these, these uh, businesses do better by empowering them, it's gonna help us all, all right? Uh, I'm very excited about stopping the flow of businesses out of our city. That is killing us right now. We need to be able to get them to stay here and flourish. Thank you. Our next open-ended question. ongoing reliance on ineffective criminalization 
and policing in San Diego to address social problems? How will you create a commitment to public safety that addresses some of these issues through non-policing strategies? One of my many hats is the criminal justice reform advocate. And as part of that, I really push for us changing the narrative around public safety. When I talk about building whole and vibrant communities, that is with public safety in mind. Because we know that certain community members of certain groups are treated differently by the police and are policed differently. Our city has done a horrible job with curbing racial profiling, addressing disparate outcomes for people who look like me. We have to be serious about what public safety means and broaden that definition to mean that we are all safe and secure from even law enforcement. We have to reallocate monies that are used where we prioritize the police being first responders. They're not equipped. If you ask them, we got one right up here. They don't want to do half the stuff that we're asking them to do, and they're not good at it. My time is up. Come on. Strategies. We need to, we need to all be safe and secure. 
And uh, I have to wonder who's going to do something for those people who stand in the middle of the intersections with signs requesting our money when they're trying to drive safely. It's very hard. They're struggling. They want to make money, but they also need a need food. Uh, there are a lot of gangs also. Uh, there are people, gang members who are polite, and there are others that kill. One, one person got killed, and it really set off a lot of anger among adolescents in my community. We need to have more peace. And as far as cost of living, too high. I mean, my wage is about to be the same as the minimum wage for fast food restaurants. We'll go back to the rapid fire questions again. Just a reminder, yes or no is totally fine. You don't need to add a sentence, but if you wish, a sentence is fine. Um, last year, the city approved a tenants protection ordinance, a crucial first step in providing more protections for renters. One example of how tenants are evicted through no fault of their own is when landlords evict residents to do remodeling projects. Given the recent flooding we have experienced, there are concerns that folks will be evicted at, at high rates to remodel. Do you support strengthening the tenant protection ordinance to include a ban on evictions due to remodeling? And I'll start with Dan. Yes or no? Ladies and gentlemen. Yes or no, Dan? Yes and no. <laughs> there are exceptions to every rule, ladies and gentlemen. And quite frankly, the question is not logical because this question involves thinking. Thank you, Dan. We're going to move on to Larry. Yes, it definitely needs some modification. Jane? Well, I know that if there's a mold that's developed, people can get really sick. So they need to be allowed to stay somewhere else first uh, so that proper work can be done. Yes or no? So yes, it, 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 there's no way to do yes or no because um, people can't get sick, they can't, the, the mold can be really Okay, we'll, we'll move on to Jenny. Yeah. Yes. 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 Workers often experience wage theft, but very few of these incidents are reported and investigated. In 2021, organizations, including the members of the CBA, fought for the creation of a City of San Diego Office of Labor Standard Enforcement. These offices always have really long names. Um, this office is responsible for enforcing the city's minimum wage, earned sick leave, sick leave living wage and prevailing wage laws. Although we know wage theft is extremely common, the office only received 39 complaints last year. Many workers do not file complaints out of fear of retaliation and or lack of information on their rights and how to file claims with the city. In addition, the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement does minimal worker outreach to ensure workers know about the office. Will you support adding annual funding to the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement to fund worker-centered outreach in partnership with labor, community, and worker-centered organizations, and know your rights training to ensure workers know how to assert their rights with the city? Yes or no, we'll start with Larry. Yes. Jane? Yes. Genevieve? Yes. Dan? Yes, absolutely, because it's a, actually it's a human right to be tr treated with dignity when you're earning a wage. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Rapid fire question. Do you support reallocating funding from SDPD toward non-police responses to social problems? Genevieve? Dan? Well, could you repeat that? You're coming blurry. Do you support reallocated funding from SDPD toward non police responses to social problems? SDG needs? SDPD. From, from police to what? 
I'll repeat it again. In general, no. I don't support that. No. In general, no. Thank you, Jim. Jane? Um, that's what I mean. Okay. Larry? Yes. One more yes or no. The Community Budget Alliance believes the city budget should reflect community needs. Our city should be transparent about how it spends its public dollars, and the community should have a say in the distribution of public resources. The question is, will you commit to meeting with the Community Budget Alliance at least twice each budget cycle to help ensure the city budget reflects community needs? Jane? Yes. Genevieve? Yes. Larry? Yes, we work for you. Dan? If we have the time, we meet every week with no problem. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. And we will move on now to our closing statements. I will begin them in the order uh, that we started for opening statements, since those were held at random. And uh, you'll have a minute each, so I'll start with Larry. Again, thank you all for being here. Good job on uh, keeping us from fighting amongst each other. But uh, again, thank you all for being here. This is great to see the community get involved. And uh, I, I remember coming to some of these meetings uh, on previous elections and not seeing so many people show up. So uh, this is great. Thank you all for being involved. This is the kind of thing we need to change the community. We all know that we need some change, right? Uh, this is The city has been going down the wrong path for far too long. And we have just been force-fed politicians from, from both parties for a long time. I'm an independent. I'm not a, I'm not a politician. And I don't want to be one. And I'm not trying to use this to uh, jump to another job after this to be the governor or something else. I want, to, I want to just retire after this and be done and raise my two little kids. That's what I'm doing this for. You know, I'm a San Diegan who just feels that the city is not the place where right now uh, is optimal for raising my two little kids. I got a one-year-old and a two-year-old, and that's why I'm doing this. You know, I hope that, that the, the mayor would have done a better job. I was uh, really hopeful when, when he took over. I thought that things were going to change, and they haven't. It's time for us to just stop this car, and we got to fire these people. As much as you might like them, they're just not doing the right job, and it's time to fire them, and we got to get somebody new in there. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate you all being here tonight, and uh, I want to let you know that when I had experience being on my HOA, there were times when we reimbursed the people who were living, we reimbursed condo owners when they could not be in their place because we had to fix the place because of rain damage. We need to be very careful in our decisions. We have to listen very much to input. Please read, please follow the internet. Please know us candidates very well. If you've already voted, thank you. If you haven't voted, please research us well. Thank you very much. Dan? I didn't come here tonight to get your vote. I came here to tell you the truth. And if you can't take the truth, maybe you ought not vote, because this is a very important election. Our campaign is not supported by the corrupt Democratic Party or the corrupt Republican Party. I am an independent. And I vow, I vow to tell all of you and work for you the truth and be honest with you. I didn't tell you what you want to hear. I told you what our campaign is all about. And God willing, we will overcome and we will make it despite the fact, despite the fact the Voice of San Diego ignored our campaign for one full year and never mentioned our name. The, the hundreds of people behind Thank our you, campaign. Genevieve? I came here tonight to tell you the truth and to get your vote. Okay. <laughs> I believe 
I am right for San Diego. It is time to get our city moving in a different direction. I didn't share everything about myself that I can, but I am an open book. I'm an attorney who has been dedicated to changing policy. I've influenced city policy, not just as a public interest attorney, but also as a city commissioner. And when I talk about my commitment to every single community, I mean that. I can't talk enough about my mother because she instilled in me a lot of values. I would see my mother, along with Connie, who's sitting right next to her, they're both retired from UCSD Hospital, and they would go on strike, and they would fight for workers' rights. And I saw my mother still go on strike when what she was fighting for would not benefit her but would benefit the workers who were behind her. That's where I come from. That's why I fight for everyone. That's why I fight so that everyone who's impacted can have a voice at the table. And that's why I want to be the mayor. Thank you. Thank you to each of you for taking the time. If I could get a round of applause.